Uh, crafting Taylor word lists with Wordsmith, Sanjeev, and Tom from Payment Software Company. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thanks guys for coming out. Um, there's a lot of cool talks happening in this 10 a.m. time slot. So yeah, we're thankful you guys came to this one. And uh, we're sure that some people had a late night last night. So thanks for, uh, thanks for making it to this one. Um, some, some quick formalities. Tom's a guy with a beard. I'm the Canadian. Don't hold it against me. Um, <laughs> we're, <Sorry. laughs> we're both pen testers with PSC. Uh, PSC specializes in PCI assessments um, as well. And we also do pen testing in, in, in non-PCI uh, contexts. Um, our day-to-day -day kind of just involves um, going through large enterprise organizations and going through various network segments trying to find cardholder data. Um, we're also looking for pen testers, so um, if you know any or if you're interested in pen testing, either um, come and see Tom and I after or Joe over here in the front, and we'll be happy to talk to you. So before we jump into a quick primer, um, what's Wordsmith? Uh, well, it's just basically a tool which can generate dictionaries. Uh, the only thing that we're doing differently is that we are generating dictionaries based on US states and specifically geolocation data. Um, geolocation data can just basically kind of be boiled down to cities, landmarks, um, zip codes, area codes, towns, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, we'll get into exact sort of uh, data sets that we're collecting, and we'll also go into some statistics a bit later. But we're taking these word lists, and we're just going against and, and cracking against large uh, hash sets, or just hash sets in general, to identify um, what sort of passwords people have and if they're introducing geo-based uh, passwords uh, into their phrases. Um, so yeah, we're going to go through a quick primer here uh, of just basic authentication process, uh, as well as the difference between passwords and hashes and dictionary tags. Um, We've timed it. It should take about three minutes. It's about eight slides in total. Uh, for those of you who already, who already know about password attacks and dictionary attacks and, and um, hashes and, and that sort of thing, um, there's going to be an image on the next slide here. And uh, if you can tweet us the hash type that's in this image, uh, we have some swag that we're giving away. So we've got like a case logic backpacks and I think uh, phone speaker amplifiers and a single selfie stick for someone who really wants a selfie stick, I guess. Uh, so that's our Twitter handles. I think it's also in your brochures. Um, or go and check out Wordsmith. I just made the repo public, um, so you can find it there. Um, and I guess just as a quick show of hands, how many pen testers are in this room? Uh, does anyone do pen testing? Uh, Joe? <laughs> a couple of, couple of guys over there? Great. So if you've ever done any sort of man in the middle of attack on your, on your network, and I guess if you're a blue teamer who's ever done a man in the middle of attack on your network, this might look, this hash type should look pretty familiar to you. Um, so yeah, uh, here it is. You got kind of a couple seconds here to take a look at that and uh, and send us a, a tweet here at our Twitter handles, and um, we're happy to give away some swag after. Uh, but for now, we'll head back to the primer, and Tom is going to walk you guys through uh, the primer. Thanks, Andrew. So let's talk about a simple authentication process. Uh, this is Bob, and the extent of my Microsoft Paint skills. Um, Despite what Bob's uh, prohibition style hat might suggest, Bob is a user in a Windows environment. Uh, and this is Bob logging into a Windows host with a username of Bob. Um, and this might be locally on a workstation in order to unlock it. This might be remotely via something like RDP. And we've taken the liberty here to unmask the password field so you can see that Bob's password is password123. On submit, when Bob clicks enter, um, that input of password123 is put into a one-way hash function. Um, and the output of that is a fixed length character string, um, which you see represented in blue. Um, that's what we call a hash. Uh, and what's important to note here is that this is a one-way function. Um, we can't reverse this process by putting a hash into the hashing function and retrieving the original clear text password. So after we've hashed the password, um, we uh, put together Bob's username and password hash, and we send it to the authentication server. This might be locally in a, a same database. Um, if you're joined to a domain, this might be um, Active Directory domain controllers, ntds.dit. Um, this backend database holds, and this is a, a little bit of oversimplification, but this back, uh, backend database um, holds a listing of all the users um, and their password hashes. Um, so we're not storing passwords in clear text here. Um, and from there, we basically just do a lookup of Bob's supplied credentials. Um, we find the record for Bob, and we match uh, the supplied password hash with the stored one. Um, if it's correct, we allow the login, 
Um, if it's incorrect, we'll uh, bump up the failed login count and deny the login. So we can't reverse this hashing process. So how do we convert a hash back to its original string? Um, the answer is there's no direct way. Uh, but what we do have are a very particular set of words, <laughs> uh, words that make password cracking a nightmare for hashes like these. Um, and we, particularly, we use a dictionary attack. So what are dictionaries? Uh, they're simply just large list of words, usually grouped together by some type of theme. Um, so they might come from password breaches, like LinkedIn or Yahoo or Adobe. Um, there's also a great word list out on the internet that you can find for free, like RockU or Tep10K. Um, there's even some paid ones, like Unique. Um, despite its price tag, uh, Unique is a password list that any pen tester or auditor should have in their toolkit. So in order to carry out dictionary attack, uh, first we need a, f a few prereqs. Uh, first is a solid dictionary, or a good word list. Uh, second thing we need to know is the hash type. So in this case with Bob, we're using NT hashes or NTLM. Um, if you're authenticating against a, a Unix or a Linux type server, uh, it's gonna be some variation of MD5 or SHA-1, usually with a salt. The third thing that we need um, are a list of password hashes. Uh, these are usually exfiltrated from compromised systems. Uh, maybe like a, a local Windows workstation or an Active Directory domain controller. Um, and these are what we're doing the lookups against. So the steps for actually carrying out uh, a dictionary attack uh, boil down to this three-step process we call the guess encrypt compare cycle. Um, our guesses are words that we're plucking from the word list and we iterate uh, through them one by one. Um, from there, we take the input word and we put it into um, our encryption algorithm, in this case, uh, an NT hashing algorithm and it gets outputted uh, this fixed uh, length string. Um, then we take that hash and we do a lookup uh, against our list of obtained password hashes. Um, if, we, if they match, then we know we can map that back to the original word that we guessed, and we have our clear text password. And Sanji, we'll move on to Wordsmith. Yeah. So uh, as we mentioned briefly at the beginning of the presentation, Wordsmith is just a, a word list generation tool for um, US uh, states and, uh, I guess, geolocation-based data. So what kind of geodata is in a word list? Well, we've got things like cities and towns. Um, we also have landmarks. So in, in Nevada, you're going to have Area 51, things like the Hoover Dam, that sort of thing. Uh, we've got streets and roads. Uh, we have zip codes, sport teams, colleges, common names, and area codes. Uh, now, why geolocation data? Well. It's really interesting. Uh, I guess it's kind of a marriage between curiosity and password analytics and just general human behavior. Um, I remember I was testing, uh, I was an internal penetration test for a client in a very small state. And as part of my post-exploitation process, I tend to go from system to system and scrape credentials out of memory, just using uh, Kiwi or Mimikast or something like that. And that usually enables me to collect a large amount of passwords to then enable me to move into another network segment or access, access applications, which unlock greater depth into that environment. Now, Collecting all these passwords, I, I realized a common trend um, for several of these users, and that's I couldn't crack these because these are specific geolocation-based passwords that weren't going to exist in any sort of password list that's currently out there. Um, things like sport team names or colleges or um, other things that might be in a, in a, in a related to geolocation. So I thought to myself, well, it'd be pretty neat if someone put together um, a wordless generation tool and. Um, then that kind of transformed to, well, we'll just put together a wordless generation tool for geolocation data. And um, as we'll get into some statistics a bit later, we kind of found out that we've limited some guess encrypt compare cycles um, and, and been able to actually turn this into something quite useful. Um, so I should probably mention where's all this data coming from. Um, well, Wikipedia and the US Census uh, have a ton of this data and it's really available to the public. All we've done is we pulled it, scraped it, and put it into nice little phrases and words which uh, appear in word lists. Um, OpenStreetMap is another good source as well. Um, we've also had to put together um, a collection of data sets for area codes uh, because that was a little harder, harder to parse using our parsing engine so, uh, and required a bit heavier parsing. So we actually have some custom data sets which we made as well. Uh, so Tom is going to talk to you about how Wordsmith works and then we're going to jump into a demo. Um, so yeah, take it away. Cool. So the GitHub repo is live now. Um, when you do your initial uh, git pull, you'll see these files listed there. Um, on the right, you see the actual Wordsmith Ruby file. Um, there's also next to it the sources.yaml file. Uh, it's basically just a simple configuration file for all the internet sources where we're pulling down from, uh, data. 
Um, and we broke it out like that to hopefully make it a little easier um, in a modular design to be open to extension um, and for easier management of our internet sources. Next to that, you see a data.tar.gz, um, which is basically just a compressed data archive where we've already pre-scraped all of the data that we're using from our Wordsmith um, and compressed it there. Um, you'll also find a, a gem file just to make installation a little bit simpler. And there's a readme there, which you'll see in the repo uh, that will walk you through some of the dependencies and in installation. So when you run Wordsmith for the first time, uh, it's going to do a couple checks for some of its uh, files that are needed. Um, if it doesn't see them, it will unpack that data.tar.gz file um, and expose it into the current working directory in a subdirectory called data. That data directory um, is mostly categorized by state, with the exception of some of the custom uh, data that we've had to massage into place. Um, the top level, you'll see some of the directory for the area codes. Um, names, which we've pulled from US Census, is first names, last names, baby names. Um, sports which are mostly big four sports in each state at this point, um, and then the states themselves. Uh, and below that, you see an example for what kind of files you would find in the California directory. Uh, so you see a cities.html there, colleges.html, landmarks, roads, zips. These are words uh, very specific to that state. Um, if you notice the .html extension, um, these are actual HTML source files that we've pulled down from our internet sources. Um, and the reason we've done it like this is because we've added a update option within Wordsmith. It's a dash U flag. Um, so sometime down the road, if you'd like to update your data uh, manually, you specify the update flag and it'll actually go out to all the sources and update your local data repository for you. Um, to parse this data, uh, we're using gems like Nokogiri and Spider. Mm -hmm. And we do all these lookups offline, uh, so locally just for speed performance. So a, a word list that's been generated by Wordsmith kind of looks like this. And I'm using an example that Sanjeev went through earlier with uh, a Rhodes from Nevada, in particular Fremont Street. Um, so the word as it comes out of Wordsmith looks like that. It's a capital F. There is a space in there. There is a period at the end. Um, so we added in some just very basic mangling uh, for words. Um, so we can split on spaces and set break out Fremont and Street into two separate words. Uh, we can remove special characters. Um, we can remove spaces. Uh, there's also options to uh, convert all of the words to lowercase, if that's your preference. Um, you can also specify a minimum character length. So let's say you've compromised a domain um, where you know the password policy has a minimum character length of eight. Well, you can specify the, dash, or the minimum length here, and it will truncate all words that are not at least eight characters in length. And now Sanjeev will take you through the demo. I've seen some really bad things happen with live demos in the past, so let's hope this all goes well. <laughs> all right, so is that text? How's that? Can everyone see that? Maybe go a bit bigger. Cool. OK, so yeah, as Tom mentioned, uh, these are kind of the, the initial git pull files. And if we just uh, go ahead and run Wordsmith for the first time, you're going to see that all these um, uh, files get unpacked. Uh, there's also a warning message that you see here where it says, cool is not found in path. Now, that's because I'm, I'm running um, Wordsmith on my OS X system. I don't have cool installed. Um, but if you're running this on Kali or something, it's going to pick that up in your path variable, and you'll be able to use cool. Now, the purpose of cool uh, is because we've integrated support for things like uh, domains and in files. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Cool, uh, basically if you specify a domain name, let's say client.com or facebook.com, it'll go out to that domain and it'll look for unique words and scrape it from that application. And um, the default Cool settings, I think, stays within the scope of that domain name and it only goes uh, a certain recursive depth and follows any hyperlinks that take you to any other links on that scope. And it'll pull the client's name, it'll pull um, other unique words and strip out some of the common words like of, the, any connection, uh, verbs, things like this. Um, and you can also um, have an in file where you specify various client domain names. And all this is just to better populate this word list. So um, we've integrated support for cool. However, uh, you don't need to use it because we also have some other options. Um, now, as, as, as we kind of mentioned, from a top-down approach, it all starts from a state. Um, and typically, when I generate a Wordsmith word list, I'll use a dash all option. And all is going to give me cities, colleges, landmarks, phone numbers, roads, teams, zip codes, uh, and also names. 
uh, names. So names would be like uh, common last names, uh, baby names. You, you have no idea how many times I see a first name or a baby name uh, as part of a password. Um, yeah, so I guess let's run through an example. So we'll set the, set the state for California and we'll look at some common support teams there. So as you can see, um, these are all of the support teams in California, and that's just doing a basic lookup on the HTML files that we've already pre-pulled. Now, these are great, but we can also mangle these and get every single permutation of these words. Uh, so as you can see here, we've got Sacramento Kings, Sacramento Kings, Sacramento, and somewhere up here, there'll probably be, be Kings as well. And there's only one instance, uh, because we've there's probably some other teams here which have Kings in their name, but we also do a sort in unique so you don't get duplicate words, and things like this. Uh, what's also um, pretty neat is that uh, we do things like um, zip codes. So we've got every single zip code in Nevada or uh, landmarks. So if we set the state to DC, um, we can look at landmarks and we probably tend to see things like White House or, or whatever, um, like uh, the Lafayette building, uh, things like this. Um, yeah, and if I guess we set the state to maybe Massachusetts, we can look at some of the uh, colleges that exist there. So these are probably see Harvard or MIT at some point in here. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned before, these are just some of the options, the singular options that you can set for per state. We can also do multi-state. So for example, CA and Nevada and grab me all the uh, area codes for those two states. Now this is pretty verbose output. Um, so uh, I guess the inverse of that would be quiet output. So let's set the state for California. We're going to grab everything we possibly can and uh, we're not going to have it as verbose as this. And so you can start seeing some um, things here of how many landmarks there are, how many zip codes there are, but this isn't really useful because we're not getting any words. So we can go ahead and output this to a file like california.txt and it'll collect all this data and stick it into a word list for you. But as we kind of mentioned before, these are just the actual words themselves. These aren't the mangled versions. So we can specify the M flag, change that to California mangled. And now you can see that there's a little churning time here for especially the roads because there's 250,000 roads that we're now going to have to mangle, which now outputs almost double the amount. Um, so like Tom had mentioned earlier, we've split on space, we've concatenated, we had strip symbols and, and, and things like this. Any other options that anyone wanted to see from this help area or um, see if a particular college that someone went to in a state shows up? Can you compare the, the number of, of roads in California versus nationally? I'm wondering how much overlap there is and, and how much benefit there is to restricting it by state. Sure, so you, we also have an option built in here for all, uh, so you can churn through every single state and create a mega word list for everything as well. Um, but, so that's, yeah, it's totally an option. Um, as you can see, you'll just start spitting out um, everything, it's just an array. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so, but that's the, with the quiet option. If I remove the quiet, we're gonna grab, basically, it's just gonna keep on churning like that. Yeah, yeah, so, um, sorry, is there another question? Yeah. That's a great option. Yeah, sorry, that's a great, um, yeah, so, sorry, uh, he said, how do you account for local businesses? Um, so the dash D flag for the cool integration. Uh, so let's say you're testing a particular client. Um, the client, the, there's probably going to be some password variation in there that's a client name, one, two, three. And so that, that uh, cool integration will scrape that client's web application, pick out that client's name, and put it into this word list for you as well. I don't actually have internet connectivity here because we're at B-Sides, and I don't want to connect to Wi-Fi. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't show you the cool integration aspects of it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's basically uh, what our, our, our Wordsmith demo is. And what's really interesting are some statistics that we're going to kind of show you guys. Um, and I think you've heard me talk enough, so I'll let Tom <laughs> kick that off. Cool. Yep. So uh, we wanted to measure how effective uh, geolocation-based uh, word lists were. Uh, so to do this, we did a couple of tests. Uh, some of the prereqs for this test, we first built a hash cracking rig uh, locally in our shop. Um, and we got our hands on some real NT hashes. 
Uh, so we grabbed some hashes from an actual real-world internal penetra uh, penetration test from clients in Massachusetts, a little over 400 hashes. Uh, Wisconsin, about 2,000, and New York, which is about 500 hashes. The hash cracking rig itself, um, our weapon of choice for cracking NT hashes is Hashcap. Um, the hardware is fairly modest, it's just an NVIDIA Grid K520. Um, but even with that, we could get about uh, 3 billion guess and crypt compare cycles per second. Uh, so we're turning through passwords fairly quickly. Um, and just last week, Sanjeev put a post on his blog um, for those interested that want to build their own hash cracking rig. And he goes through the process of doing so um, in Amazon's AWS. So he takes you through the steps of spinning up an EC2 instance, um, getting Hashcat installed, configured, ready to run, and so you can start cracking caches. So some of the test cases that we're going to go through. First, we're going to crack hashes from each of those states uh, using some basic word lists and um, some rules. Uh, and then after that, we're going to supplement that with word lists generated by Wordsmith. Um, the syntax that we use to generate those word lists in Wordsmith is shown at the bottom there. Uh, the basic way to read that is the dash S flag is for Wisconsin. Um, the dash A, we're grabbing all categories, so cities, colleges, roads, etc. Uh, we're going to do some basic mingling on those words, and we're going to output them to a text file. Uh, in this case, Wisconsin generated about 112,000 words. Massachusetts was around 82,000, and New York was 158,000. So the input parameters for this cracking session, when we look back at that guess and crypt compare cycle, um, our input is uh, what we're guessing from those word lists. So we're using top 10K, which is 10,000 words. We're using ROCU, which is a little over 14 million. And then we're using a uh, word list generated by Wordsmith for each corresponding state, so uh, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, and New York. And we chose the rule set of dead hobo just because it's one of our favorites. Um, it's got about 57,000 rules for doing some advanced word mangling. The compare phase, uh, the encryption algorithm choice is NT because we are using, uh, we're, we're trying to crack uh, passwords exfiltrated from a domain controller here. Um, and NT is based on MD4. Um, and for the compare, we're doing lookups against the obtained password hashes that we got from each of those domain con or domains in each of the three states. And Sanjeev will discuss some of the results. Yeah, results are in. So, uh, yeah, Wisconsin, 2011 Enthelium hashes, which kind of can be translated into 2011 Active Directory user accounts, which can kind of further be translated into 2011 employees, although that might not necessarily be true because there might be some accounts being shared. So we'll just say 2011 Active Directory user accounts. Now, as Tom had previously mentioned, the top 10K word list is just a collection of the top 10,000 passwords. Things like password, love, God, anyone who's seen hackers you will know, get that reference. Um, but yeah, we're taking those 10,000 word lists and we're um, injecting those individual words into the dead hobo rule set, which is 58,000 rules. So these rules can prepend symbols, append numbers, lowercase words, camel case words. So for every single word, you're doing 58,000 different permutations of that word, word based on this rule set. So yeah, the, the 10,000 top passwords uh, took about two seconds to run against these rules and uncovered 237 of these organizations' passwords, which means that 237 Active Directory user accounts had a password that was in the top 10 word, 10,000 word list as a root password uh, in their, in their uh, I guess, password string. Um, yeah, Rocky uncovered another 1,094 uh, passwords, which is now we're at 66% of a cracking success uh, in total of all these hashes. And now our Wisconsin generated word list took 12 seconds to run and uncovered another 11%. So that's 229 passwords. Now, what should be uh, key here is that uh, this Wisconsin word list is solely, uh, it solely consists of geo-based passwords. So at this point, we've cracked 66% of the passwords, but um, the additional uh, 229 passwords are all things like cities, sport teams, landmarks, uh, zip codes, and, and things to that effect. So there's a question over there. Are they discrete, or would there be duplicates between Rocky and Rocky? There would be duplicates. So this is a collective cracking session. It's called basically your hash cracking pot would be populated with 66% uh, of these passwords at this point, and so it's a collective addition. So yeah, we uncovered another 12. Uh, or sorry, 11% of passwords um, uh, that were all geocentric. Um, now, yeah, so if I remember correctly, uh, Wisconsin, some of the really common passwords like Green Bay, Packers, um, first names and baby names as well. 
Uh, Massachusetts had a, a smaller hash set, about 400 uh, Active Directory user accounts. Uh, that makes top 10K with the 58,000 rules run in about a second and recover 52 uh, passwords, which is about an eighth. Uh, and that's really surprising uh, because it just goes to show that some organizations have really weak password complexity um, uh, rules and enforcements. Um, Rocky uh, 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 recovered a staggering 65% um, in 24 minutes and uh, with the dead hobo rule set and our uh, wordsmith generated word list another 56. Um, and again, this is all geo-based word lists, uh, or sorry, geolocation-based words, uh, which, which are found after um, in about 12 seconds. And Massachusetts, um, I mean, people always use sport teams names like Red Sox and things like this, but what's really interesting is you'll see a lot of city names as well, like Boston, uh, Boston Marathon, um, Cambridge, and Harvard, and Fenway uh, for landmarks as well. Uh, New York, uh, 552 hashes and 552 active directory user accounts. Um, what's really surprising with New York is that zero were recovered with top 10K, which can, we can allude to several things here. Either the active directory um, domain controller has a third party plugin. Uh, so this New York organization has imported a list of known uh, compromised passwords or bad passwords into active directory through some th sort of third party module, which technically refrains uh, users from uh, creating bad passwords. Or uh, as a non-technical control, they have um, just great uh, security awareness programs or long and complex uh, password uh, requirements um, or, th or things like this. That being said, uh, the Rocky word list, which takes about 26 minutes to run, uncovered about tw 220 passwords. And our New York uh, wordsmith generated word list uh, recovered an additional 59. And as you can imagine, um, some of the popular passwords would be landmarks like Empire, or uh, I think I have some exa examples here. Yeah, Empire, Broadway. Uh, there's also one user in particular who had the state NY abbreviation, and then um, five numbers, which are the zip code, and then a symbol as part of his password. So yeah, um, Tom's gonna kind of uh, summarize that last sort of segment there. Cool. So some of the conclusions of this, oh, yep, go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, did you try uh, the New York data, the New York hashes against the Wisconsin list? No, we didn't. No. Because that would be very useful to see whether you're actually getting sure. value from your, from paying attention to geography as opposed to just what's on these lists. Absolutely. So, so you need to do that crosswise. Sure. Yeah, so another, to, to further extrapolate that, we can also just do all states in general against that New York word list as well, but the real takeaway here was just kind of for that particular state and that guest encrypt compare cycle. So for one state it took 22 seconds, but for all states it might take an hour. Who knows? We haven't actually tried to do that yet. But that's, yeah, great question. So some of the conclusions from this testing. Um, we got a little bit of confirmation bias here in that uh, we'll get into the psychology of how users choose passwords, but we know that users like to choose passwords that are near and dear to them. They choose passwords off things that they know, um, you know, the street they grew up on, the name of their child, and that's what we're seeing reflected here in our results. Um, and with that, there's a little bit of a time CPU cycle trade-off in that instead of using a blanket word list and looking for low-hanging fruit, we're spending a little extra time up front to craft a more tailored list um, and we're spending less time, uh, or less CPU cycles, on crunching those less pertinent words. Um, and it's a small sample size here, but with these cases, uh, we, had, uh, we cracked at least an additional 11% um, of passwords in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and I think this speaks a little bit to the, the relevance of the generated passwords. So next steps for uh, Fordsmith, where we see this going. Um, we're always thinking about data. Um, we have ideas for more. It's uh, difficult. To, have an, uh, to actually marry uh, an idea for data and actually find good sources for it. Um, but we like to expand on, say, the sports. Uh, we've seen users who love to have their favorite athlete or their favorite player as a, the base word of a password. Um, maybe team mascots or names of stadiums. Um, you could include famous people like politicians or actresses or actors. Um, state symbols, things that are very relevant to a state, uh, such as the motto or state song or state flower. Um, and we've gotten recommendations from the community too. Uh, Larry Pesci recommended looking at regional food or um, cuisine or agriculture. 
from the design, the code design perspective, um, it is modular. Uh, we like to we like it to be even more so, uh, just to have it open to extension. Um, we think that this framework could be extended to not only include states, but also to include provinces or territories or even other countries. Um, and we could even change the granularity of how we're looking for this. Uh, when Sanjeev and I were concepting Wordsmith, we were thinking about uh, what scale do we want to start with? Do we go you know, as macro as continent, or do we drill down to country, state, city, road, address, uh, actual geo coordinates? Um, so maybe a future version could, instead of a user inputting a state, they input an address or a pair of coordinates, um, and they specify a default radius of, say, 50 miles. They say, give me all the words that Wordsmith can generate in a 50 mile radius. So Sanjeev and I are, are both believers in free and open source software. Uh, we believe that everyone should have access to all the source code at all time. Um, we also believe that we're not the smartest people in this room. So if you guys have any ideas for data, uh, for features, if you um, have experience with uh, looking at a, a query in um, APIs for you know, geocentric type data, we would love to talk to you. Um, please send us a pull request, uh, submit issues, um, hit us up on Twitter. Um, the repo is listed there. Uh, we'd love to, to, to share this with you. So with that, this is contact information. Um, also, if you uh, replied to uh, Sanjeev's uh, hash challenge earlier via Twitter, uh, feel free to hook up with us. We'll either be at the back room or in the passwords. Uh, and just bring some verification that uh, it's actually you on the other side of the tweet. Um, but with that, we thank you for coming out and yeah. open the floor to questions. Yeah, thanks, guys. Well, I'm pretty sure there are questions for this, and I have questions myself, tons of them, actually. <laughs> uh, but as an example, I just want to tell you that in the UK, there is one government organization that keeps on tweeting again and again and again that a safe and you know a good password that is also easy to remember is made up of three easy words. That's what they keep saying all the time, three easy words. Now on December 4, 2015, Hashcat put out a tweet saying, important announcement, and there was a hash value. And very shortly afterwards, Solar Designer replied to that tweet saying, the hash, if you can crack it, says Hashcat open source. So that's the way Hashcat announced that Hashcat was going open source. And Solar Designer cracked Hashcat open source. That's a three word passphrase with spaces in between words. So Jeremy uh, Gosney, he responded by asking Solar because Solar said that he cracked this by doing a 10 line focused word list. So 10 words mm -hmm. he put into his word list and then he cracked a three word passphrase. And the words that he put in was hashcat is open source, will be, will be, uh, without a space in between, sourced GPL under license. And he cracked it. So that's pretty, <laughs> you know, that was like, dude, lies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Now, I'm going to kick up one of the, my first questions first for this. Um, first of all, have you been looking into the simple fact that there can be, as an example, uh, physical and geographical locations that consist of more, more than one name, like you have a space in there. So uh, the sea of something, sea of oceans or whatever you want to call it. Uh, are, are, does Wordsmith today actually take that into account or will you just say that anything with a space is two different words? Uh, so, no, we take that into account. So if it, if it does have a space, we keep the original string, mm -hmm. we split on that space, we concatenate that string as well, so we get the common permutations of that particular word, and it also has that word in the word list as well on its singular level. Okay. Now, we didn't want to do too many permutations because we th thought that the hashcat rules that people would use afterwards would uh, do that for them. Uh, so we didn't want to make the word, li word list too inflated or too big um, because mm. hashcat rules would take care of that at, in the cracking process. Okay. And, and to keep um, the keys unique, so uh, for instance, when you're inputting a state, 
like for instance, uh, North Carolina, which has a space in our District of Columbia with two spaces. Mm. Um, our keys, we sub out spaces for just, uh, we basically URL encoded, mm. um, just to make sure we keep the keys unique. Yeah. Uh, okay, so in, in Europe, when doing passwords come there, I have had Sebastian Revo do two talks at different times about generating word lists based on different wikis, including Wikipedia. And his, 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 his talks are essentially about you know, how he created the Wikipedia, Wikipedia word list and the issues of identifying what's a password, what's a passphrase, what's just random gobble in there. And, and I highly recommend his talk from Cambridge in last year because he actually uh, also uh, could prove that Han Solo is mentioned in the Bible, which is kind of cool. <laughs> it just depends on how you actually uh, break up all those spaces and so on, but Han Solo is actually mentioned in, in the Bible. So, questions? Cool. Arnold first. So, first, thanks for a really good talk. Oh, um, I just, uh, as much a comment as a question, which is, I think you have really a very powerful tool in having these three sets, and I hope you can do some more studies on it. And in particular, the new, there was a discussion earlier uh, about the question of, in one of the earlier talks, about whether um, blo blacklist dictionaries and, and password generation are dangerous because people, when you reject their password, they just add one or one, two, three to that. And you have a, a place to actually do an empirical test there with the New York database of saying, okay, go back to that uh, top 10, 10K word list and do apply some software that does you know, various munging to that and see, and see how many, in fact, users having been rejected just did a simple transformation. So I encourage you to do more with it. Great. Sure. If you want to send us your organization's hashes, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you actually asked that question to the guy who invited Diceware. So you know, he, he does have a word list at least to provide, so to speak. <laughs> So to ask kind of a different question, um, when evaluating an individual word within the context of a dictionary or a hash, um, is there any metric that can be generated for understanding how likely that is to appear in word lists globally? This is, for example, uh, password, God, I love you, one, two, three, et cetera. Um, we, we commonly are told that, yes, this appears in many, 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 many dictionaries, but we don't have a metric or score to tell us how likely it is to appear uh, and how dangerous it is within the context of a password. Is there any way we can generate that? Is there any you know, Bayesian analysis, probabilistic analysis that has been done on corpuses of words that could tell us, given a word, how likely it is that it is going to be cracked by one of these tools? I don't know. To my knowledge, uh, in, in terms of the community, there hasn't been any sort of um, collective analysis on every single breached word list that's out there, as well as a collection of words uh, to identify, um, I guess, the, the singularity or the commonality of a single phrase across all these lists. Um, however, that being said, uh, in our penetration testing reports, we use a tool called PIPAL, uh, P-I-P-A-L. And uh, that shows the, I guess, the, um, in terms of a percentile, how many users are using this word or this root word um, in, in context of all the user accounts or hashes that we have or have recovered. So the only thing I can think of is marrying Pipple and uh, all those common word lists out there, but that would take a lot of, a lot of um, computing power to do that. And so it's almost a project in its own, right? But that's a great idea. It sounds maybe, like a great talk. Yeah, you should, you should, <laughs> you should do that. <laughs> yeah. oh. Questions? Sorry. Yeah, I was wondering uh, on the on the hash set that you were working on. Did you do any combination of the word lists? Did you combine the word lists that were generated from WordSmith with the top ten thousand or with Rocku? Yeah, I know that there's like a function in Hashcat for doing that. Yeah, it's so that's a good separate question. from the mingling rules, right? Yeah, no, we didn't combine uh, word lists. So we were we were kind of more interested in the chunking aspect. So this is what the top 10K recovered, this is what the Rocky recovered, this is what we recovered after that entire pot had been populated. That's a great, yeah, so if we can combine password and White House together, that'd be great. So that's maybe something else that we could have done. Well, when you started out on doing this, I mean, obviously you do, uh, you know, there's data available, massive amounts of data available for, for doing the geolocation part of this. 
But when you started out doing this, was it, you know, did you start making uh, Wordsmith because the data was available and you saw you could easily use them? Or did you actually have, uh, you know, uh, uh, a theory or eventually did you prove that lots of people are actually using geolocations as part of the password? So we need this input, you know, what was the reasoning so, behind starting it? So part of it was, um, as we compromise uh, Active Directory domains, we dump password hashes and we start cracking. Um, one of the things we do after we were churning through the rock U's in the top 10 K's is we would uh, kind of generate our own custom word list based off root words that are, for instance, like the company name. Um, and we do some of the common uh, translations for that, and converting Z uh, O's to zeros, and A's to at signs, et cetera. Mm. Um, and also just some of the names of local, you know, like, like the street that the, the company is on or the address where the building resides. And we noticed we started getting hits after hits after hits using that pattern. Mm. Um, so then Wordsmith came about as a way to kind of automate and weaponize that process. Okay. And as a, as a second part to that as well, we just thought it'd be kind of cool to do this um, because no one else has really done this before. And uh, going back to like the inception of Wordsmith, the story of that, uh, I just, as I was scraping credentials out of memory, I would see that people have been using these phrases uh, in their passwords. So that was kind of like another um, catalyst for this tool. Mm. You could uh, have asked us in an email it, later on. Yeah, I could have asked you in an email <laughs> later on, yeah. But <clears throat> I'm, I'm more interested in getting your, your feedback for everybody. This will come up in your review. Don't worry about it. Great. This is Joe. He's our boss. Yeah. He paid for us to be out hey. here. Yeah. <laughs> During the course of, of your testing and analysis, other than the one Hashcat rule set, did you find any others that were more efficient? Yeah. That, that extended uh, what you were doing on top of, of the, the targeted uh, list and what would those rules be for the rest of us? Sure. So we used three different uh, rules, but we found that those two other rule sets uh, existed in this Hobo64 rule set. So we used rule1.rule, which contains 5,000 rules, and we used Hobo64, which contains the top 64 uh, in the dead Hobo rule set. So we do also have metrics on that, which I can post out to Twitter or to the GitHub repo, but this hobo rule set just was a, a, a collective 58,000 rules of, uh, that just sort of encompassed all of those. Uh, I'd just like to say that um, it looks incredibly useful and I'd like to encourage you to make it work in other countries, um, particularly the UK. <laughs> we, would, um, we would love for you to help us do that. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, yeah so, well, if, uh, well, what have you people got against the letter U? <laughs> Colonial. Um, <laughs> some advice on how to tweak it for the UK sure. or for another sure. country. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I was in the, I was in the Netherlands and, and also in the UK recently doing a pen test, and um, I kind of showed this to some of the um, clients I was working with and just told them to check out the talk if they had time. They mentioned the same thing, and that kind of... Um, I, Tom and I were speaking about that, and that's why we kind of extrapolated and made it modular now. So um, we hope to build on that, and hopefully there could be a UK-based um, implementation in Wordsmith 2. I don't know if this was uh, covered, but um, so uh, mass processing. So if you want to say, like, show me all passwords to have capital, they're length 12 and all that stuff, was that covered in, in this uh, version of, of the Wordsmith? So there is a feature oh, yeah. to, uh, yeah. you pull it up, you want? Yeah. Um, there is a feature to uh, specify minimum character lengths. Um, there is a feature to you know, convert to all lowercase. By default, it's going to usually come out as capital case. That's how we pull it out of the HTML sources. Uh, but you can massage the data to a degree. So yeah, we set the state here for California. Um, Z is, or, or Z is for the zip codes and K is for the character length. So going back to password policies, if your organization has a minimum of seven, um, we could specify seven here. We all know that zip codes have five characters in their string, so if we specify a minimum length of three, we're still gonna get all the zip codes. Four, we're gonna get all the zip codes. Five, we're gonna get all the zip codes, but if we set it for six, we're not gonna get any. And we're just drilling down on zip codes here. If we went for all, which is uh, every single option available in Wordsmith and set it for six, you'll see that we'll churn through everything, every single road, every single city, landmark, zip code, area code, whatever, that is under that six character uh, specification will be removed from the word list. But if you, uh, oh, sorry, the next one. Sorry, um, I was just curious since you mentioned sports teams and I've seen a lot of users definitely use sports teams. Um, 
If you use Curl um, to do like the FIFA website, would that be able to scrub those team names or would we have to like manually enter them? Um, Cause soccer is huge, at sure. least in the Bay Area. So um, absolutely. Yeah. Just um, curious. Give me 10 minutes after the talk and I'll answer that question for you. Cause we'll do it together. We'll type in FIFA.com and we'll see if it gets some sport names. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the things I've been telling uh, many, many times over and over again, I uh, passed with this comment as well, is that if you are a student looking for an assignment, something to do, or if you are a security researcher and you for some magical reason actually have spare time, <laughs> please feel free to contact me and I will make your life living hell for the next 10 years <laughs> with work to do. You know, I have lots of things that I would like to see being be researched. And one of the things I'm looking, still looking for is uh, and that's also the, the reason for why I asked, you know, why did you initially start doing this? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've been interested in doing, and I'm kind of asking around if this could actually be done at all, I would like to see somebody make a tool or some kind of, you know, uh, thing to pretty much uh, put uh, words, the base word of passwords that we can find from leaks into different categories. So, as an example, house or car is a physical object while dream or anger is not something physical so my question is could we analyze password leaks or password from pen tests and categorize them and because i'm interested in looking into you know what kind of categories or words are people actually using when they create passwords mm. one of the things i have done is i have analyzed passwords based on gender and facial hair and hair color. I have done that. I have statistics on that. Women with red hair, red hair have the best passwords. And guys that looks like Unix gurus have the absolute worst passwords. <laughs> I have evidence of that. But I'm very curious about that. So if somebody's interested in, in work to do, you know, give me a call. And with that, I will say that we are going to do a 10 minute break before we'll go move on to the next speaker. So again, Kanjib and Tom, please. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. guys.